Right now on The Daily Debrief, a prosecutor drops charges against a woman for miscarrying her baby after being shot in the stomach. Plus, a Navy SEAL acquitted of murdering an ISIS terrorist. And... I, I'm going to admit Mr. Nelson. Another day, another outburst from a defendant facing a possible death sentence, then an apology. I was getting uh, into my feelings, I guess you'd say. Is it sincere? The Daily Debrief recaps the day in court. It's Wednesday, July 3rd. Welcome to The Debrief, everybody. We're glad you're with us this Wednesday evening. An Alabama prosecutor will not move forward with a manslaughter case against a woman indicted by a grand jury for miscarrying her baby after she was shot. A grand jury found that Marche Jones played a role in causing the fight and therefore should be prosecuted for causing the death of her fetus. Jones was five months pregnant. She was fighting with another woman she thought was involved with her child's father. Her defense attorney said the state's indictment was based on a novel theory unsupported by state law. Attorney Joseph Tully joins me early tonight to discuss this matter. So Joseph, this is out of a state that has basically pushed forward with conservative legislation saying a fetus is a person with rights and also a state which recently criminalized abortion. So what do you make of the case? Well, it was pretty shocking to hear about the allegations. Um, this is a woman who was shot in the stomach and there was, uh, you know, talk of charging her. And I'm, I think the, the prosecutor made the right decision. Um, I had to kind of think it through before I even understood the legal reasoning behind such a case. And, and it was basically that a woman being pregnant put her unborn child into an area of danger. Um, and that was, but their attorney is right or her attorney is right. Um, you don't charge somebody who got shot in the stomach with murder of their unborn baby. Yeah, you know, as the defense said, it was really a novel theory here. The prosecutor said there are no winners, only losers in this sad ordeal, but didn't give any further explanation or comment uh, as she announced the, the dismissal of the charges in this case. Uh, can we read anything further into it? Is it just that uh, maybe it was too novel? I, I Yeah, it was too novel. and. A prosecutor has an ethical duty not to pursue a case if they don't believe that um, they could prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And a lot of people would argue that that, you know, is a saying only and is not in practice. But I think the prosecutor knew that it was just too novel and there's no jury in the wor world who would convict someone who uh, got shot in the stomach. Yes, she did possibly put her, her child in a, in a situation involving danger, but she... Um, you know, got in a fight. She did not expect to get shot in the stomach, nor did she expect to lose her child as a result of that. It might be tough politically for the prosecutor to go forward because remember, a grand jury did want charges here, did want a trial. The prosecutor reeled that back. But, you know, this same grand jury did not indict the woman who actually pulled the trigger. I'm guessing some kind of stand your ground thing here because this woman who lost the child was the first aggressor and the woman on your screen right now the one not indicted, even though she was the trigger woman? Uh, yeah, so this is something where we'd have to know the facts behind. Um, if somebody comes up and pushes you, you can't pull a gun out and shoot them. But if somebody came up to you with a baseball bat, it might be uh, lawful for you to defend yourself by by taking even the first shot here. So um, I, I we'd, we'd have to learn more of the facts behind this. It's a complicated case. Joseph Tully will be back with you as the broadcast rolls along. A Navy SEAL accused of murder and attempted murder in the death of a 15-year-old ISIS fighter was acquitted at a military trial. Earlier today, Chief Investigative Correspondent Brian Ross spoke on the Law and Crime Network about the case where another man took the stand and admitted he, not the defendant, was responsible for the terrorist's death. What made this case so unusual was the tight-knit code of silence that maintains inside the Navy SEALs was broken with four members of uh, Gallagher's platoon essentially testifying against him, alleging he had killed uh, one captured teenage ISIS terrorist and randomly shot at innocent civilians. Uh, his lawyer, Tim Parlatore, acknowledged it was highly unusual, but told me in an interview before the trial began he planned to take these witnesses apart. I'm absolutely saying that they're lying. I'm looking forward to cross-examining them. You know, these are, they're supposed to be our nation's elite warriors. And yet I look at NCIS videos of them crying as they're telling stories that then when you pull out the video of the actual event, 
they're clearly lying about. So I can't wait to get these guys on the stand. And you're going to take them apart, you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. We intend to annihilate the government's case. And he did just that. It took the jury of all members of the service, all combat veterans, just eight hours to come up with the verdict. The only thing that Gallagher was found guilty of was posing with a corpse, and he held the man's head in his hand and then tweeted, I did this one with a hunting knife. It was a tweet, uh, a text rather, not a tweet we understand now, and that was Brian Ross reporting earlier today. Gallagher's punishment is a reduced rank and a four-month sentence, which he has already served. A federal judge has denied a motion for a new trial for a convicted Mexican drug lord. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman sought a new trial because two jurors had seen news coverage of the case. But both jurors said they immediately looked away from a newspaper and a Reddit headline the minute they realized the headlines dealt with a trial upon which they were seated. El Chapo was convicted of 10 counts after more than 50 witnesses testified against him. Yet another outburst in court from a Florida defendant convicted of murder and facing a possible death sentence. Defendant Scott Nelson took the witness stand earlier in this case and said he killed victim Jennifer Fulford because he needed money. On the witness stand, Nelson fought with prosecutors and blamed his probation officer for meddling in his attempts to maintain a job and housing after he was released from prison for robbing a bank. The defense now has the case and is trying to spare Nelson from execution. Here is today's interruption in the proceedings. M44, can you read back the question? Mr. Wolf, Mr. Nelson has chosen no sex with special housing. You can't call me. I'm sorry. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, you need to take a moment. Mr. Nelson, you need to take a moment with your turn. He's out of control. Hold on, sir. Sir. Members of the jury, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, are we clear that you're going to stop talking? I need a verbal affirmative. Yes. I'd like to ask the word. Mr. Nelson, talk talk with your attorneys, and then your attorneys. We, I, I'm gonna, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, Ms. Simmons has asked for a moment to talk with you privately. I'm gonna grant her request, and you're gonna have that opportunity. You need to follow the deputy's instructions so they can facilitate this. Okay, go ahead. And there you have the defendant being led out to basically talk the situation over. This is how the judge ultimately responded after that. Mr. Nelson, have you had a chance to talk with your attorneys? Uh, they've explained a lot to me, yes, sir. Do you have any issues of proceeding at this point? No, I, I don't have any issues at all, sir. I'd just like to proceed. And, um, I, 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 I was getting uh, into my feelings, I guess, to say uh, it won't happen again. Do you understand, although you, you're on trial here, yes, sir. that if you violate the court's orders and you do not conduct yourself in a manner in accordance with the court's orders, which includes, but is not limited to, the decorum policy, that you can forfeit your right to be present during your trial and I can have you removed from the courtroom. Do you understand that? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Have you had a chance to talk with your attorneys about that? Yes, I have. At this point, uh, you've now violated, you've engaged in two outbursts. Uh, are you confident that you can comply with the court's orders and continue to do as you've been doing, which is sit here at the defense table, work through your attorneys privately in private conversations to convey your desires to them as you have been doing, and otherwise speak only through your attorneys unless the court uh, asks you for a direct response. Do you feel confident you can do that as we proceed? Yes, sir. Those outbursts came during testimony from a prison expert who tried to help the defendant's image. Overall, he got that Nelson got along well with staff. And then the other was a, an instance with he and some officer, I believe in Orange County, where there was a verbal altercation back and forth, and then Nelson apologized to him. That happens. I mean, in the heat of the moment. And you mentioned um, a step-down program? Yes. Is it the RHU? 
Yes. Can you tell us about that? The RHU is a reintegration housing unit in Oakdale, Louisiana. Uh, what that is is a step-down unit, and, and it's actually an integration unit. In other words, we're going to send you there because you can't get along well, you don't play well with others. You know, we're going to send you there, and hopefully you can make it through this program, and once you're released, then you can start making it out in the general compound. And normally it's a three-step program, I think it still is, where you go in with limited privileges, and that lasts for a certain period of time. And then as you progress and you do better, then we're going to increase your commissary, we're going to increase your phone calls, we're going to maybe increase your recreation. And then as you interact with other inmates better, you'll go to the next step and then to the final step. And then hopefully you make it out of there and you do well. Nelson failed. That's one side of Nelson's life behind bars. Let's listen now to cross-examination. What sort of disciplinary issues has Mr. Nelson had in the Orange County Jail? Uh, refusing to go to court. Uh, he had an issue with one of the officers over some hair clippers, I believe it was, where he wanted to get his hair cut, and the officer said in a minute, and Nelson said no now. So that was a verbal altercation there. Uh, there was another issue, I believe, when in the, one of the court holding cells, he demanded more food. Has Mr. Nelson uh, threatened anyone in Orange County Jail? Oh, yeah. yeah he, when he did the barbershop thing and that sort of thing, yelling and threatening. Has he alleged that some inmates in the Orange County Jail are receiving treatment better than him? Yes. He's been fairly graphic in those statements, hasn't he? Yes. And he's been using racial slurs in making those statements, hasn't he? Objection, Your Honor. That objection was ultimately sustained, so we don't have the final answer. Attorney Joseph Tully is back with us again tonight here on The Debrief. So, Joseph, we're hearing these questions about racial slurs, and then we saw the defendant basically blowing up over suggestions that he's a racist. So, so this is a, a difficult question, but uh, is this guy defending himself better than his attorneys, or is he just making a mockery of everything, making a mess of his own case? Involved, uh, a defendant is the better. And here there's expert testimony that he suffered brain injury, that he does have a uh, mental illness. His mother was a schizophrenic, so uh, that he was, you know, repeatedly abused as a child. So um, really he would be a lot better off leaving it to his attorney. Okay, so, you know, bottom line is he was trying to prevent the testimony about uh, perhaps his own racial thoughts from getting in front of the jury, but he, he's uttered these phrases before in the past, and the expert's going to get him out there in front of the jury, bottom line, right? Yeah, and, and he looks like a jerk in front of the jury. The, the jury doesn't care about the content of what he's saying. They care that he's interrupting proceedings and that he's yelling. So they're, you know, they're seeing somebody who's boisterous and causing trouble versus listening to the message that in his mind he wants to get across that I'm not a racist, they shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, somebody who's not going to behave if he's incarcerated uh, for the rest of his life, might as well put him to death. That's what the jury may be thinking here. So, Joseph, just from a uh, procedural standpoint at this point, we understand there's one more defense witness coming up on Monday after the holiday here, presumably uh, an expert who couldn't fit it in a schedule this week. But I wonder, is the defendant going to take the stand again during this penalty phase of the case? Because he was boisterous on the stand during the first phase. Hmm. Um, so... It's always up to a defendant whether or not to testify. So really only he is the one who, who knows that answer. Uh, the, the attorneys might not want him to testify, might advise him to not testify, but yet whether or not he does testify is solely within his hands. Exactly, and we may see it again. We'll have to see. Joseph Tully will see you at the bottom of the hour here because still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, we're going to head back inside the Scott Nelson trial with testimony from relatives of the defendant and the victim. Welcome back to the debrief. Let's take us back now to the Florida trial of Scott Nelson, where the defense called the defendant's brother to talk about the defendant's upbringing. This was all part of the defense's attempt to prevent a death sentence. My mother had uh, suffered several in her lifetime nervous breakdowns. And she obviously was hospitalized for psychiatric reasons. And uh, during the course of 
her being admitted to the hospital on several occasions. She was subject to uh, shock treatment therapy, as well as placed on a regimen of, for many, many years of psychotropic drugs. When Scott was born, uh, he, he didn't leave the hospital with my mother. My mother needed to be hospitalized for a longer period, and Scott went to uh, live with my paternal aunt, my father's sister. Um, at the same time he was living with her, she was raising her own set of twins and a son. So she was raising three children that were all approximately just a little older than Scott. Next, a brother talked about abuse and violence inside the Nelson household. You also mentioned that your father was physically abusive. It ranged from slapping and pushing to where um, I was hit with a two by four on more than one occasion. Um, he would throw things at you. He did these things to you and your brother, Robert? Yes, oh yes. And was Scott around to witness these acts? Um, but it was most prevalent, Scott was very small, so I don't know that uh, it was something that he would recall having witnessed. I think that Scott did not get the physical abuse, and I can't be sure of that because I wasn't in the home all the time. Can you give me an example of the type of things that your father would do to your mother in front of you? I remember when my mother was carrying Scott, it was... We were out and we were going by this uh, Dairy Queen ice cream place and my mother wanted to get this drink called an orange freeze. And my father didn't want her for whatever reason to have it. And um, he pulled in, like tore the car off the road, slammed the car into the parking lot and started hitting her. And my mother was... She was probably about seven months pregnant at the time. Defendant Scott Nelson's cousin has barely seen him since 1967. Still, that cousin took the stand to testify about more abuse within the defendant's family. I know you mentioned an incident with a black eye, but were you ever aware growing up or even later on of domestic violence between Mr. Nelson and Joan, your aunt? Uh, I didn't witness it firsthand, but I'd heard my father talk to my mother about it from time to time. Okay. And you you indicated this one time that at least that time you saw physical injuries on Joan. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And other than that one time, were you aware of times that Joan would come over to your house? I know she came over a few times to visit, and she'd call my mother and father and talk to them, but I... That was the only time that I recall seeing her there. When she came, she came alone? Uh, I believe so. Um, did you ever see the boys, and by the boys I mean um, Scott and Jim and Robert Nelson interact with their father, Larry? Uh, only when a couple, a couple of times when we went over to babysit. Based on their behavior, did you believe they were afraid of their father? Yes, I did. Objection, speculation. Any the objection to the form of the question. Did you see their behavior when their dad was around? Yes. Was it different when their dad was around than when he was not around? Yes. And can you describe what types of behaviors you noticed when their dad was around? Uh, they were very quiet and subdued. Uh, after they'd leave, the, their attitude would totally change and it became fun time with my father and, and me. So now moving on to Joan Nelson, are you aware or were you aware as a child of her mental illness? Yes, I believe she was institutionalized twice. Those relatives testified for the defendant, but back during the state's case, the victim's husband shared his thoughts for the prosecution. Jennifer Fulford was my wife, my best friend, and quite honestly, amazing. She was the mother of two children and also a proud grandmother. According to Jenny, she was going to be on her front porch in a rocking chair with a glass of wine, watching her great children play in the yard when she passed away. She was supposed to be 95 years old. 
Today, we all know how Jenny died. But I'd like to share a little bit about how she lived. Jenny was amazingly intuitive. She could not hide her feelings, and it was impossible to hide, her feel hide feelings from her. She almost had a sixth sense that she liked to call the Hungarian voodoo. She had a special talent for bringing out the best in others. She had a way of knowing that, what a, that a smile would improve an angry passerby's day. She would often start up conversations with a stranger that would begin to sound like they were old friends. There are too many things to list, so I will end with the most important. Jenny was loving. A list of things that Jenny loved could go on for hours. First and foremost, she loved her family. She loved people. And she loved the holidays and she loved animals. She loved life. She loved me. I will always love her. A collision of two families under horrible circumstances to talk about now with attorney Joseph Tully, who is back with us one last time. So, Joseph, the way this has to play out legally is the state presents the aggravating factors, and we heard many of them. This was a vicious stabbing. The victim did not die right away. It took possibly up to five minutes. We heard about the defendant's previous incarceration. The defense presenting these mitigating factors, family history, abuse, mental illness, brain injuries. How does it all weigh out? Well, from a juror's point of view, the prosecution witnesses are very well spoken. They're very emotional. It, it, they're having, they have the capacity to move people who are listening to their words. And the defense's witnesses, um, the process of it is being, very, it's very clunky and even awkward at times. And I'm not criticizing the defense. Sometimes that's what you have. But um, they're they're getting little nuggets here and there. They're getting out that there is mental illness uh, in the in the in the defendant's background. They're getting out that the defendant suffered some physical abuse by his father. They're getting these things out, but it's not in a very effective way. So, but again, the the juror has to weigh out the aggravating. They have to say that there's you know it's very very aggravated mm -hmm. and that there's no mitigation. And here, if the defense can pull out at least something that they could point their finger to uh, in closing argument and say, listen, ladies and gentlemen, this is mitigation, then they've done their job. Exactly, and it's a tough case because the defendant has been acting out and it's probably not endearing him to the jurors. Joseph, we appreciate your insight here on the debrief. Happy 4th of July to you. Thank you so much and happy, uh, happy 4th of July to you. Happy birthday, and happy Happy 4th to those of you watching. We'll be back on Monday after the holiday when court resumes.